Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. I am Jeanette Barnard, creator of Prime Future, and I am kind of geeking out a little bit today because with us is Mike Salguero from Butcher Box. So um, this is a story that has kind of flown under the radar if you weren't paying attention, but I've been following it for a few years and uh, just super impressed by what they've done. And I'm a believer that they are really leading the, the future of how consumers are gonna buy meat. But uh, Mike, thanks for joining us today. Why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about Butcher Box? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, so my, yeah, my name is Mike. Um, I run a company called Butcher Box, uh, butcherbox.com. And we, uh, we ship meat in the mail is what we, the easiest way to explain it. Um, and what we do is we ship uh, what we call claims-based meat, uh, but um, essentially meat, antibiotic, hormone-free, every, every individual species has its own claims. Uh, we've been at it for just over five years. Um, I started in 2015. I had been running a different company called custommade.com that connected artisans with consumers, took a bunch of venture funding um, that didn't really work out as planned. And, uh, you know, while I was running that company, my wife um, found out she had a thyroid condition um, called Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune disease. And um, we started following all these diets and they all said, eat grass fed beef. And uh, we couldn't find it anywhere. Um, so there might be ground beef in the grocery store, but that was it. There were no other cuts, no short ribs, no briskets, no steaks. And um, I just set out to try to find grass fed beef for her and uh, couldn't find it. Ended up finding a farmer um, in, we live in Boston. He was in near New York. We met in a parking lot, probably illegally because the, the meat went across state lines. Um, and I started buying cow shares off of a farmer and, you know, got a home and was like, wow, this is so much better. And, and in many ways, it was exactly what we, I was trying to do with custom made, which was to connect a consumer with the, um, with the, di the maker of the dining room table that they were going to sit at every day. And like that, um, that relationship is like a really neat relationship. And so the idea was to connect a consumer with the food that they're eating and the meat that they're eating and to do it in a way where um, we honor uh, the animal, the environment, the farmer, and, and really try to bring a high quality product to the customer. Um, I couldn't figure out how to make that work. So I was probably working on it for, I, I always had these ideas in the back of my head of my next business and, um, and none, of them, none of them were in food other than this. And I couldn't figure out how to ship a box of meat across the country. And I, I finally um, hunted down the former head of operations of Omaha Steaks um, and he helped me get started. So he made some introductions. He really like explained the ropes to me and, um, and, and helped me um, push it forward. And so uh, without him, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have gotten going. Um, and it was always, um, so having left a business that we raised a venture, venture, venture capital, I, I didn't want to raise any outside capital. Um, a whole host of reasons that I'm happy to talk about, but mainly I didn't want other people telling me what, what to do or how to build my business. And so we started to make these decisions to make the business a um, fairly easy kind of autopilot type business. Um, and the idea was this was going to be my hobby. This wasn't going to be like a full-time business. This was like my hobby business. And so um, we wanted it to be frozen because the, the chain and inventory is so much easier when it's frozen. Uh, we, we launched with a curated, um, a curated box. And the idea was you choose the species, so beef and chicken or beef, chicken, pork, and then we just ship you a box. Um, you don't know what's gonna be in there. We'll just ship you stuff that we think is great. And, um, and, and have it be a subscription because we wanted to basically replace the, replace your meat purchases. Um, and so I had no idea if the business was going to work. I, I, I thought I'd use it, but I, I had no idea. Um, and so the other thing is we started with a Kickstarter campaign because, uh, I was not confident that, um, it was worth it to buy a bunch of inventory and hope for the best. So. We launched a Kickstarter campaign in September of 2015. 
um, literally three days before uh, our Kickstarter campaign, uh, Consumer Reports cover story said the case for grass-fed beef. Um, so, uh, you know, a lot of people like, like to talk about how success in business has to do with timing. I mm -hmm. think our timing was amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we launched a Kickstarter and um, it was clear very quickly that we had struck a nerve, uh, that um, we, we just saw way more sales our Kickstarter, we went out to raise 25,000 in, in it's like pre-sales and we raised like 215,000 um, in 30 days. And so it was people who were like, oh, wow, I've wanted to eat this way, but I've never been able to find it or I want to support this. Um, and that was really um, confirmatory that like my experience of trying to eat healthier and feed my family better was actually the experience of a lot of other people. Um, but so we got into this business and like, I had no, um, I mean, I, I love meat. I'm, uh, my, my father's Uruguayan, uh, I was born in Paraguay. Like I have, I definitely have a tie to eating a big steak and like, you know, that's mm -hmm. been part of my family, but I was not in the meat industry by any stretch or farming I had no idea about either. Um, but I, I, I am a learner. So basically I had to go to school on all of it. Um, and, uh, we, we have a core value of relentless improvement. And, uh, what that means to me is that we're never done. We're never d done bringing the best possible quality product or removing, uh, waste from the value chain to pass those savings on to the customer. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think, um, it's been an, an amazing ride. Um, and, uh, we're just, Super excited that I'm super excited to be talking to you. I've been reading your stuff for a while. I'm as much of a, a fanboy uh, of you and your writing. And um, yeah, super excited to talk about um, what we do and, and also kind of the impact of where tech and meat intersect, which is such a fascinating space to be, uh, to be in. These are all the right words, Mike. Okay, so before we go down the thread of, I wanna talk about things that are gonna interest our meat people. First, let's talk about the tech side. And before we get there, let's talk about fundraising. So you talked about your previous exp experiences raising venture capital, why you didn't wanna do it that way this time. Yep. A little bit about the Kickstarter. For those of us that are kind of around the tech industry, startups, geek out on that kind of stuff, talk to us more about that and what the contrast in your two experiences and what drove you down the Kickstarter path. Yeah, sure. So my first company, I raised $27 million in five rounds of financing. Uh, we had Google as one of our uh, investors. We had first round capital. We had a, a, a number of like top tier venture capital firms. Mm -hmm. And um, I think for, for custom made, um, my co-founder and I, we were really good at like convincing people to give us money. Um, but the product market fit wasn't quite there. And, um, so it was always like, you're always selling for the next round rather than like, you know, kind of executing on the round you're in. Right. And, um, when I thought about this business and first of all, I thought about it as a hobby. So I was like, I don't need to raise money. Cause I'm just gonna, if I sign up a thousand subscribers, you know, and I make $10 a box off them, like, great, I got a little business on my hands. That was kind of like what I was thinking. Um, so there wasn't any need to raise money because I didn't want to grow like that. And then as I got into the industry and I, it's kind of like peeling back the onion of being like, oh, wow, this is actually way bigger than I thought and way more interesting. Then it became like, I don't really want people who are just driving towards an outcome. Mm -hmm. um, like the way that venture capital works is they raise money for a fund that fund usually has a lifespan of 10 years, uh, depending on when you get into it is how quickly it needs to, you need to kind of have an exit. And their job, the person who's on, sitting on your board and telling you to do things and whatnot, their job is to get you to drive towards a outcome. Now they might tell you like, oh, we're really patient and whatever, but either way, they have to then go raise their next fund. So they need to show outcomes. And so you're pushed to, to, to maybe cut corners, to maybe think differently. Um, and I, I just released a paper to uh, our company where um, I'm thinking like, instead of, you know, what's our plan for this year, I've been thinking like, what is, what does a hundred years from now look like? Like, why are we talking about a, a, a one-year plan or a three-year mm -hmm. plan? If, if we're trying to 
grow and disrupt grass-fed beef in this country, that is not like a, a two-year thing. Like, you know, it's, it's at least 10, if not longer. And so we're like, let's embark upon the road now, but let's just realize and recognize that this could take years and years and years. And if you look at food, if you look at the companies in food, the brands in food, they've, they've all been around since like post civil war. Um, you know, whether it's Kellogg or Post or Hershey's or uh, Mars or, you know, it's like these, all these, all these companies that um, uh, they've been around for a very long time. And even to me, you've Tyson and Purdue and Cargill and like, they've been around forever. Mm -hmm. And so this notion that we'll come in and do something different is just, that's just not how it works. Um, meat takes a long time. At the end of the day, you're not, I'm sure most of your audience knows this, but you're not like building a widget, right? You're growing an animal. Um, and to do that right and to always be trying to make the right decisions, it just takes a, takes a really long time. And so I think in some ways, you know, I started, I thought this was a hobby and now I've moved to like, oh, wow, like, we have an opportunity that I don't think many companies would have because of the way that we started where we thought it was going to be a hobby and didn't raise money. We've got no one breathing down our neck. We have nobody who's like, okay, uh, I need an outcome now, go do something. Um, and that means that we can be dedicated to doing things right, taking our time and building something uh, from scratch the right way. And quite frankly, I think that's what the meat industry needs. I think the meat industry uh, needs disruption. And uh, that's what we're here to do. And I just love that perspective of we're in it for the long haul. We're here to disrupt, but we're in it for the long haul. This isn't a get in, get out kind of kind of situation. Um, so no, that, I mean, that's it, and that's been that's been for me has been part of my growth. Like when I started, I was like, okay, a hobby, and then I was like, all right, but yeah. this is working. I should go sell. And then it was like, huh, maybe I should just hold on for a little bit. And then I've gotten into it. It's been like, you know, this could. This could be my life's work like and i i think that's pretty amazing i mean i think that there's lots of work to be done here and and, and a lot to prove and um you know if my life is, is dedicated to helping farmers make a living wage and helping uh helping animals to live a better life and helping the environment to regenerate like that's pretty great so i'm 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 locked in uh yeah that's awesome Okay, so now let's kind of shift to the, talk about the fundraising. Now let's kind of shift to the, the challenges of starting this type of a company. So <laughs> let, me, let me first of all, just confirm when you started ButcherBox in ButcherBox the Hobby for Mike, yes, yep. was there any option besides Omaha Steaks where, you, where a co consumer could purchase me online? Yes, there was. So uh, there's a okay. company, U.S. Wellness Meats, that's been out for a really long time. Um, and then there were there were a whole bunch of um, individual uh, farms. Yes. Yeah. So the problem with individual farms is that um, the the shipping and logistics to get a box to somebody's door is so prohibitively expensive. Mm -hmm that it, it, it could never, it, it could be like a purchase once in a while, but it's never gonna be somebody's like monthly staple. Um, and if it is, they just like, they don't care about the price at all, right? So um, we, we knew that we would have to do it way more efficiently. And we knew that we'd have to take more of an Omaha Steaks approach where they're selling a box for $50, right? And so they've, they've really dialed in all the costs. Um, but yeah, so there wasn't, but no, there wasn't really, there were a few people out there, but nobody who was taking our approach. And um, yeah, yeah, we were we were kind of the first on that. One. Yeah. Okay. So so in that environment, then what? Talk to us about what were the early challenges that you had to figure out of if we're gonna if we're gonna figure this thing out, we got to work through X Y Z shipping logistics, getting yeah. supply. Walk us through. Yeah, that. all of it. All of it. Yeah. So what you know the the we started working with a company. Um, that had a cutting facility and the ship, a pick pack ship facility. And so that was the first place that we went to. Okay. So that was amazing because they basically could handle everything for us. They could handle uh, procurement. So we, we started, we were just going to do grass fed beef, but we started interviewing people just to like, you know, collect information. Yeah. And it was very clear that the problems that I had outlined grass with beef also existed in other species mm -hmm. so when we launched we launched with beef chicken and pork um but 
Uh, yeah, no, I mean, it was, first of all, what do you put in that box, right? How do you get that box at the right price point where people open it and they're like, wow, this is great. This is a lot of food. Um, finding the right farms to work with or, or the right companies to work with. Um, uh, yeah, all, I mean, when we, we basically didn't order anything until the Kickstarter had launched so that we knew that's the beauty mm -hmm. of Kickstarter. We can pre-sell. So we knew, okay, we have a thousand boxes to ship out. All right. Like let's now let's procure the meat and, yeah. and, and put it in the box. And then let's call all those people and try to get them to roll to a subscription. And, um, yeah, I mean, tons of tons of early challenges. I mean, one of the ones that I love the most is the first six months um, we shipped in a styrofoam cooler, a styrofoam container. So uh, that's how the industry has been built. A lot of meat like within the industry is just shipped in styrofoam. Um, but a big styrofoam cooler, and then it had like shrink wrap on it and a butcher box sticker on it. And, um, you know, people get these boxes and be like, Mike, like, I, I can't believe you're using styrofoam. And I'm like, yeah, me neither. Uh, we, we need to build a business first. Like we're trying to disrupt meat, not necessarily right. styrofoam. Um, Managing, yeah. Yeah. And, and now we're on V5 of a box that's fully, you know, fully recyclable, um, all from recycled materials. Like, it, we're just in a completely different spot. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that that's like a, a I, I like to tell that story, especially to want to be entrepreneurs, because oftentimes, especially if you uh, are focused on like having some sort of mission focus, like you believe that business can be for more than just um, like to make money. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes there are things that you have to do to hold your, and hold your nose, knowing like this is not where it needs to be, but it's the best that we can do right now. Right. Um, and, and so, I mean, tons and tons of challenges. We, we spent the first, so we started in September of 2015 in October on Halloween of 2016. So basically a year later, we hired our head of meat procurement. And so that first year, I mean, we were, I mean, we we're not only getting completely taken advantage of, I mean, we were <laughs> Way too much money on stuff and had no idea what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Probably had like, you know, meat that who knows, like I fell off the back of a truck. I mean, it was, it was, we had no idea what we were doing. Basically. Sure. Um, then we brought in Mike Billings, who, um, you know, has been in the industry for 40 years. He has that BJ's running meat and seafood for 27 years and then had retired. I found him on LinkedIn. We went and got a chicken sandwich at Shake Shack, and then he started working for us. And when that connection was made, and Mike Mike realized, like Mike grew up on a turkey farm, and and he always believed that the meat industry could be convinced to do the right thing. It's like it's, they just need somebody to put up a flag and start charging, and they'll they'll follow. Like if right. if there's a if there's a buyer there, people are happy to raise to whatever standard you want. That's right. Like, just give me a market. Um, and so you, know, when we joined forces, that's when kind of things started to really, really make sense. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously marketing was a big challenge. Um, we got really lucky with, um, influencers. So we went out to, um, people in pe basically the diets that my wife and I were following, yeah. but paleo, keto, whole 30, kind of all these diets. And we went out to the, the people that write blogs and said, Hey, mm -hmm. like, we literally found grass fed beef because of this article you wrote, but you don't tell anyone where to buy it. So I just started a company that like, could we partner. Um, and so we, yeah, we just, we just went like that for a while and, uh, and, you know, had started in my living room and then moved to a closet of a friend's office. And then we moved to a larger office and then we've just grown and grown and grown. It's just been a really, yeah, it's been really, really fun. Very humbling. It's like, I did not expect this at all. Um, right. Very, very humbling ride for sure. But you've obviously, I mean, that's that to me, that's what's so cool about it is that you guys are proving out this alternative model, this alternative way of, of doing things in the meat space, um, which I find so interesting. So yeah. oh. for you as an outsider coming into the meat industry, what were some of the things that surprised you about the industry? And I'll just say the broader meat and livestock entire supply chain what was surprising to you as an outsider coming in um 
I think the biggest misconception that people have is that big is bad. Um, and big is not always bad. And this is like, a you know, whether you want to talk about like um, food safety protocols at a larger harvest facility versus a smaller harvest facility, or even like um, how the animals treat it. You know, people, people think if, 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 if a harvest facility has 2,000 head that they're going to be treating the animal way worse than 20 head. And the reality is like, if you're the, you know, if you're, you're maintenancing the captive bull at a 2,000 head facility, like that thing can't not fire correctly. Right. A 20 head facility is like, eh, you know, it's a, and, mm -hmm. and I don't mean small as small as bad by any means either, but I think um, what we learned pretty quickly, what I learned pretty quickly was, um, we had to figure out who was willing um, to make changes and to do things right, but could, could do things at a scale that we wanted to go to. Um, and I think that a lot, of, a lot of people who have played in the space of grass-fed beef, um, you know, the, the, the conception of grass-fed beef, when I say, hey, we're in grass-fed beef, and I go to like the meat conference, uh, it's usually like, too small, too expensive, will never work, mm -hmm. that's it. And it's like, well, that's true if you take the approach of trying to have individual farmers overnight boxes to end customers, like that'll never work. Yeah. But if you can, if you can figure it out, um, I do believe that we can compete against commodity beef um, and do it at a price point that's accessible to more people. And, um, and so I, I, I think one of the things that we learned was that, um, there are people in the industry, even, even though they're large companies that are trying to do things uh, the right way. And if we could find the right partners, um, we would have an easier time. Um, that was one big one. Uh, I, I was surprised at the, um, I've been very surprised at the lack of brand awareness in this space. Um, there really aren't any meat brands. I mean, there are some, but when you ask the average customer, like, oh, what brands of meat do you eat? They, they don't know. Right. I mean, especially in beef, I mean, people say certified Angus, which isn't even a brand, right? It's like mm -hmm. genetic. Um, they don't know brands. Um, and so I am, I'm 39. Um, I'm at the, the tail end of the millennial. I think I'm like the last year or the oldest millennial. Um, I only buy brands. I have my iPhone and my New Balance shoes yep. and you know, like my lucky jeans and like, I just buy brands, that's what I do. Um, and the people behind me are even more brand loyal. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just think that's really interesting. Like the grocery stores have for 10 years plus been removing brands and putting their own brands on stuff. And the meat industry has just allowed it to happen. And now I think it's like, well, how do you differentiate yourself? And you know, in, in, a, in a market that is a uh, commodity, how do you non-commoditize your own product? Um, and um, I, I've been very surprised that brands, brands were not uh, as, as big as I, I think they could be. And so right. even with ButcherBox, like where we want to be known as a brand, uh, we don't want to be known as a meat logistics company. Um, mm -hmm. we want people by the brand and maybe that means you can go to a fast casual restaurant and get butcher box on the menu, or that means that you can go to your local grocery store and get butcher box. Um, we, we think that's the opportunity, uh, for us rather than like, uh, you know, sending a box of meat more efficiently than, than anybody else. Right. Okay. So love that concept. So let's, let's talk about this a little bit more. So tell us about, Tell us a little bit about, more about who your customer is, like what's true about them. And one thing I'm curious of, do you find, do you think, do you hypothesize that more customers are purchasing from ButcherBox because of the way they can do business, of the way they can buy, the way they get shipped meat in the mail, the ease of it all, or is it because of the, the, the claims and the grass-fed beef and all of the claims by species? What's your, what's your sense on like, what's really important to those customers? Yeah, we call it access and convenience. And unfortunately, it's pretty much split 50-50, uh, okay. at least the last time that we looked, where you have some customers who live in the middle of nowhere, have decided that they want to eat this way, but really um, can't find it. 
And so for them, it's an access issue. Um, and then there's the, the uh, convenience of, okay, maybe I can go to my grocery. And it, over the past five years, the industry has responded by bringing more of these products into a grocery store. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, I would argue that the products are not the same. Um, that the, there's lots of different ways to define grass-fed beef, for example. There's lots of different things out there. And so the customer is just getting more and more confused. Um, but uh, for those customers, it's like, oh, I just, my meat is on autopilot. I just get a box of meat delivered to my house, exactly what I want. Um, we're also uh, priced competitively to retail. So especially as you start to, we have like member specials and start to add stuff to your box. I mean, we we want to be we want to be below retail delivered to your door uh, because we think that's what that's what wins. Yeah. Uh, and and retail because of um, mainly concerns about shrink and concerns about the market size has never really priced um, this product at a price that is accessible to you know to to more people. So the price mm -hmm. is higher than it than it probably needs to be. Um, uh, what was your other question? The customer. Yeah, yeah, just just what's true about your customers. Um. Yeah, I mean, we're we 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 trend slightly urban, urban or suburban. So people mm -hmm. who are closer to major urban centers, we're uh, to be expected. Um, we're kind of on the. Uh, not the total upper end of income, but I, I think it's, we have not yet built a product that's like accessible to all. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a higher income bracket. Yep. Um, generally, uh, um, uh, families, um, or at least one, one kid or multiple people living mm -hmm. in a house, like three plus people living in a house. Um, and, and skews uh, a little bit older. So um, more like, uh, 45 and above um, really kind of, and then either because of the way that we we started or because of the product, um, we certainly have people who are trying to make a, uh, an impact on their health. Um, and so a lot of people move to butcher box or move to this way of eating. I call it like an awakening. They have some sort of awakening, which is like, oh, whether they, they read like omnivores dilemma or they read a blog or they saw a movie there's a moment where they're like, wow, I should be eating differently. And then at that moment, that's where we want to be where they turn to, right? So, um, and, you know, I think thus far, more and more people are, are kind of waking up and, and saying, well, I want to eat differently. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the market has grown. Yeah. So I, earlier this year, I had a conversation with Lamar Steiger, who he's the consultant that helped Walmart to engineer their new supply chain with 44 farms. One of the things that he said that stood out to me, um, and I've had a lot of conversations with industry people about this, is he said, when we started going through that process to help Walmart kind of reimagine their supply chain, we were shocked to realize how little everybody in the supply chain knew about everybody else in the supply chain besides their either the step right before them, their supplier or their customer. So whether that's cow-calf producers to backgrounders, stock, stockers to processors. So I guess one question I would have for you, well, and I'm going to back up and I'm going to add on to that question that I think that's true even in just the traditional commodity supply chain. I think it's all the more true than when you start talking about grass-fed, start talking about e-commerce. These are maybe not necessarily things that the industry is comfortable with yet. So really broad question for you is what do you wish that the industry, what do you wish that livestock producers, cattle producers, poultry or hog producers um, knew about either the world of e-commerce, butcher box specifically, or your customers? Yeah. So I think for uh, a farmer or rancher, um, you know, 98% of the cows produced in this country go to a feedlot, right? So um to convince somebody to do something different is hard, uh, especially when you're third generation or second generation, you've been on the farm, your, your family was on the farm, you've done it one way for all these years. And to say like, oh, actually I'm not going, I'm gonna figure out how not to send the, the, these cows to a feedlot and keep them. Uh, um, very few people believe that 
they're the right person to make that decision and to move things forward. And I think what the pandemic has done is it's unearthed like the, the whims of the commodity market can be brutal. Um, and so many people got uh, basically just crushed by, by uh, March, April, May, June with uh, lack of chain space, with lack of buyers, with just, you know, it's just incredibly sad what happened where you have all these buyers who want meat and all these producers who have the animals and there's just like the bottom fell out. Yeah. Um, that didn't happen in the non-commodity space, right? So that that was a problem in the commodity space. That was not a problem in the non-commodity space. And I think that that one moment um, had people start to think like, oh, maybe I can do things differently. Um, and, uh, you know, for a small producer, I think e-commerce is attractive. Um, the challenge with e-commerce for a small producer is um, the logistics are just so prohibitively expensive. I mean, the dry ice, the next day, all this stuff mm -hmm. that just it's it's really expensive. So, um, I think I think it's it's how do you how do you build a market? How do you do the right thing? And how do you possibly partner with people like us who are out there trying to grow a grass-fed program yeah. uh, in the US, a bigger grass-fed program in the U.S. Absolutely. Okay. So that leads in then. So kind of last question, what, what can you share with us about the future of butcher box and where you're going? So you uh, talked about building grass fed in the U S you talked earlier about butcher box as a brand expand on any and all of that that you want to. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, one of our biggest challenge. So when we started, um, when we started five years ago, we wanted to buy all domestic grass fed beef. And we realized pretty quickly that my perception of what grass-fed beef was and the reality of how the animal was raised were completely at odds with each other. I, when I thought grass-fed beef, I thought uh, no confinement, animal out on pasture, eating grass. Um, I did not know about um, confined feeding operations where you can call it grass-fed even though it, it is grass-fed, but it's, it's just a different right. approach. Um, and so, uh, when Mike came, we started having a debate of like, well, should we be moving our volume elsewhere? And we ended up moving, uh, the majority of our beef production to Australia, um, Australia and New Zealand. Um, and I, we've been trying ever since to bring it back. Um, we had a program in Oklahoma that fell apart. Uh, we, we now have several programs that we're launching in the U S, uh, because we're just going to work with multiple people and try to build a grasp. I mean, the reality is it has to be built from the bottom up. Like we have to, yeah. we have to do everything and it's going to take years. Um, but where, where we want to be is um, we want to be the, the signal in the market that if you're willing to grow an animal uh, the right way uh, and work with us, like we want to work with you. And, um, and that, that's really exciting. And I think, um, you know, I'm in talks about like a 10 year cattle vision, which is like yeah. super, super cool conversation to be part of. Um, and, and I think technology is like a really interesting piece on that as well. I think um, in many ways, Austra Australia is a, a bit ahead of the US in terms of RFID tagging, in terms of quality um, tagging, in terms of, uh, it's way easier for us to say, hey, we want an animal like this uh, there than it is here and in this country the whole industry uh, marches to um, choice, prime, and select. But that's not how grass-fed beef should be graded. And so there's like, you know, I mean, each piece of grass-fed beef, in order to make grass-fed beef a thing in this country, you've got quality ratings that need to change. You have uh, financing that needs to change. A lot of times these animals have to trade hands because the loan is due. Like there's, you, you can't just, it's like a million dollars worth of cat, like you, you, you mm -hmm. don't have the money. So they have to trade to the feedlot, even though that that might not be the right thing. Like there are all of these, these things that need to be kind of addressed. Um, not to mention um, diversity in farming, which we think is important not to mention um, like uh, there is, there are land issues. I mean, to, one of the complaints is if you want to grass fed everything, everything, you can't have as many cows. And it's like, well, is there a way to solve that? Like, really digging into uh, right. solutions is, is right. where we want to be. 
and thinking uh, about it from the lens of what could be not from based on current methodology and a grain fed system where we just, you know, plug and play, it's, it's going to have to be rethought. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, we have the, we have the customers and the buying power and like, and, the, and the wherewithal, um, to just like, you know, if it takes 20 years, it takes 20 yeah. years, but like, if we could, if that could be our mark that not only did we build a brand that, a customer is uh, proud to serve to their family, but also on the on the back half that we actually do the hard work to build this industry into what we think it could be. Um, that that'd be amazing. So we're we're super excited for that. Okay, wait. So I I know I said one last question, but I have one more last question. Yeah, sure. Is that is that a, is that one of your children right there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Lucy. Oh yeah, she um, looks like a future grass fed beef eater. That's right, which is the current grass with beef eater, right? Even better, Not even better. <laughs> okay, so tell me, quality rating. So so you said grass fed cattle should be, those carcasses should be graded differently than choice prime select. What should yeah. that look like? Well, so um, I'm, I'm going to be talking a little bit out of school here, uh, but um, in Australia, there's a MSA rating, which is uh, based on, I think, 14 points of, of different, uh, there's ge a genetic rating, there's an age rating, there's um, a pH level rating. There's a whole bunch of ratings that then roll up into one score. Um, and that does not exist uh, here. It actually was created, I, I think it was like created by the USDA, but like they don't use it. Like, so nobody nobody grades that. Yeah. Um, oh, they that's grade super price amazing. Um, right. And if you think about choice, choice prime select, it is it is a mark of how much marbling yeah. there is in the animal. And right. if you are trying to not have the animal be on a feedlot, um, that doesn't matter, right? right? And so when you talk to a lot of grass-fed beef producers um, in domestically, because of the rating system, which oftentimes can give benefits to like, oh, if they're more choice than you, you, you know, like there's there's a benefit to raising the animal to 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 look more like a commodity animal. Um, then they they might be making different decisions on how they're feeding how they're feeding them or uh, what supplements they're using or like what you know it just or even it, the genetics. Yeah, the genetic it, yeah. it uh, incentivizes. I'm, I'm a big believer in like aligning incentives with what you want to actually have happen. Yeah. And the, the incentive structure is not necessarily the right incentive structure. Um, yeah. So I, yeah. there's a lot that needs to, there's a lot that needs to occur, but um, yeah, I think, um, but I, I, I do think that the industry um, can get a bad reputation. And I, I, again, like I've seen very large companies you know, people at the heads of or close to the heads of those companies, like they're trying to do the right thing too. It's just trying to balance all of it, and really trying to trying to work within the confines, um, provide uh, good, clean meat to people, um, while also, you know, I, I think, like I said, at some point, if there's a market, a lot of that's people right. will build to that market. It's just that's a question right. of like being the market. Um, and so that's where, that's where we come in. Our job is to build a market. Um, Creating the opportunity. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. Very, very last question. Now, if someone is watching this and wants to get in touch with you, whether it's a producer or, um, a processor, whomever that wants to get in touch with you about this initiative around us grass fed beef, should they contact you on LinkedIn or how should they get in touch with you? Yeah. I have, um, CEO at butcherbox.com. Um, they can okay. just email me and, uh, yeah, I mean, we um, were eager to talk to anybody. Um, love, love being in the industry and talking about the industry, and um, and we have a lot to learn. Like I, I, like I said, I've been in this for five years, so I, I don't know the meat industry nearly as well as as good as uh, I will eventually, and I should. Um, and um, you know, I always love going to the meat conference and, and meeting people and talking to people. And um, yeah, I, I welcome all all sorts of contacts. Awesome. Well, I think it's, uh, I just think it's exciting to see somebody working towards building a new market, building new opportunities for these animal protein supply chains, um, and just proving that it could be done. So, uh, thanks for joining us today, Mike. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much.